everybody. I'm Pam Otto. I'm here today from the St. Charles Park District and the Hickory Knolls Discovery Center to talk to you a little bit about life in a pond. Now, uh, I bet your whole life you've been seeing creatures from a pond, whether you realize it or not. Things like frogs and toads, those are quite obviously connected to water. But today, uh, not only are we going to look at them, but we're going to explore uh, a lot of other life. Uh, that you might not associate with starting in water. Things like dragonflies and damselflies, uh, lots of creatures that are part of your everyday summer life uh, actually start their life here in a pond. Why don't you come with me and we'll go explore life in a pond. All right, so we're, uh, we're indoors now uh, after our collecting adventure, and we're going to explore the creatures that we found when we dipped our net into that pond. We're gonna start off with a little video, uh, just for perspective size. This is a, uh, this is a white uh, collecting container. It also happens to be a uh, Chinese takeout food container. So if you can uh, picture that for scale, it's about, um, Oh, maybe eight or nine inches, 10 inches wide. Um, within this container, we have a multitude of creatures. You'll notice we've got a lot of tadpoles. These small dark ones are uh, toad tadpoles. As uh, the video progresses, you're going to see that we have a larger tadpole in there too. That is the tadpole of a green frog. Let's take a look. Creatures. Um, I'll dip in with my finger here. Uh, there's the big guy, there's the uh, green frog tadpole down at the bottom, now skittering across the top. We've got some uh, back swimmers here, um, pointing with my finger, and then this is a most interesting creature. We'll explore this in depth in a couple more slides, but that is the uh, nymph of a creature, an insect called a damselfly. Uh, I'm moving its back end in the water. Those three little tails there on the back of that nymph are actually its gills. That's how it takes oxygen into its body. Um, and we've got a couple of snails here. Uh, this is a left-handed snail, which we will again explore in a few slides. Move some algae out of the way and uh, let's see what else we got. I think we've got another, yep, another snail. You'll see this one's got some globular things on the top. That's actually an egg sac being produced by that snail. So uh, this pond is going to have lots more baby snails in just a short amount of time. Now, uh, those uh, small tadpoles, as I mentioned, those small dark tadpoles, those are the uh, uh, juvenile form of the American toad. Toads are pretty familiar, I think, to all of us. If you've ever uh, been in a dark, uh, cool, shady environment, uh, whether it's in the woods or your yard, um, you're going to be familiar with uh, the American toad. It's one of our most common amphibians in the area. We would not have American toads if it weren't for the ponds that we have um, surrounding us. Uh, on the left-hand side of the screen here, you can see the young uh, toad, they call them toadlets. This little guy here is about the size, a little bit bigger than a pencil eraser. At this point, it's been out of the water a few days. Uh, the, the metamorphosis that frogs and toads undergo is just astounding. This creature went from breathing uh, oxygen through gills underwater to breathing uh, oxygen uh, through lungs on land. So um, quite an amazing transformation. In about three or four years, it's going to go from tiny, tiny uh, size of your fingernail up to, uh, this is a large female American toad. I snapped this picture the other night. She was actually heading to uh, the outdoor lights at Hickory Knolls uh, to have a snack on a few moths and other insects that fall uh, and become her dinner. Uh, now we've got uh, that other larger tadpole that was in the pan, I mentioned that was a green frog. Now you might be thinking, well, yeah, most frogs are green. But there, believe it or not, there is a specific type of frog called a green frog. Superficially, it looks a little bit like a bullfrog. But when you start breaking down um, some of these details, you'll see that it's not. For one thing, green frogs only get to be about the size of a man's fist. It's a pretty good size for a frog, but it doesn't come close to the size of a mature bullfrog, which can be the size of a a dessert plate, or uh, sometimes even a little bit bigger. Uh, green frogs are one of a couple of species, uh, the other being the bullfrog, uh, that you can actually tell whether it's a male or a female just by looking at this spot right here. 
um, behind the uh, eyes, we have the tympanic membrane, which is the frog's ear. In a female, that um, tissue is going to be about the size, maybe just a skosh larger than the eye. But in a male, uh, that ear is going to be quite a bit larger than the eye. I always think that's interesting because frogs, you've probably heard frogs and toads calling from ponds. Um, that's a key part of their courtship and their mating um, rituals. The males are the only ones that make sound. And I don't know about you, but I've always thought that, you know, if a female is trying to make a choice, um, based on sound that she should be the one with the larger ear but no it's the males um, it, it must have something to do with competition and their uh, desire to uh, outdo the guy next to them but anyway males have larger ears and uh, females have smaller ones so here we have our damselflies uh, you might recognize this picture here on the left. This is a, a screenshot taken from our video that was at the beginning of the program. This is a damselfly nymph. Now, this is a creature that uh, starts its life uh, in a pond, lives there for probably a year or more, prowling the depths of the water, looking for insect prey. Um, they are 100% predatory. They do not eat any plants at all. Uh, they grab small insects up to and including mosquito larvae as they're walking around and growing, shedding their skin multiple times in the water. Uh, when it comes time to live on land, they will crawl out and they'll find uh, maybe a log, maybe a, a stem of a plant. They'll shed their skin one more time and then they begin their life as an adult. And this is probably the format we're most familiar with. This one here, this is a male uh, one of our blue damselflies. Up here in the top right, we have uh, another kind of damselfly called an ebony jewel wing. You can see how it gets its color from its ebony uh, dark wings. This happens to be a female. Females are a little less brilliantly colored than the males, but they have these white dots here on their wings. The males lack the white dots, but they have a, a um, wonderfully deeply hued metallic green, sometimes a greenish blue color to their body. They really do look like jewels flying about the air. Now, sometimes when people see damselflies, they refer to them as baby dragonflies. But as we'll see here, uh, damsel, uh, damselflies are actually quite different from their cousins, the dragonflies. Both damselflies and dragonflies are in the same classification, the same insect order, which is Odonata but um, their adult forms and actually their juvenile forms too are, are quite different. Uh, here we have, we did not dip a, uh, a from our pond, we weren't able to find a, a baby dragonfly. So I, I put this picture in. I'm sure there were some there. We just weren't lucky enough to find one in our net. But this is what a dragonfly looks like. Now in our area, they'll live in this uh, phase anywhere from one to say maybe three years in the water. Uh, eating also insects. These two are predators eating um, insect prey, although some of our larger species like uh, the green darner here, they can actually, as juveniles, capture uh, prey, uh, vertebrate prey, animals with backbones, things like small fish, even some of those black tadpoles like we had in our collection bin. So they, they uh, again, like the damselfly, they prowl around in the water, consuming insects and growing, shedding their skin. And also like the damselfly, they um, are breathing through gills. However, the damselfly, remember, they had those three feathery structures coming off their back. The dragonfly actually has its gills inside of its abdomen. So it will suck water in, extract the oxygen, and then push water out. This is a really handy arrangement if a young dragonfly finds itself in a spot of trouble because it can suck some water in and then shoot it out. And in a, a sort of a jet propulsion, it will uh, send itself uh, shooting through the water and away from whatever sort of dangerous situation it has found itself in. Now, as I said, it, it eats, it grows, uh, it sheds its skin, it does this multiple times. And then finally, it's time to emerge crawl up on a plant stem, a leaf, uh, in this case a twig, and it's going to shed its skin one more time and it's going to emerge as an adult dragonfly. Now you can see as it's coming out, it's not 
quite ready to fly away yet. Those wings need to unfold a little bit. They need to get some fluid in them. And the whole insect body needs to dry out. Once uh, it's had a few hours uh, to do that, it's going to assume this adult form. It's not going to shed its skin anymore at this point. It is a mature dragonfly. And uh, that's uh, how it will remain. Now, you'll notice when a dragonfly is at rest, its wings don't fold across its body the way the damselflies did. The wings of a dragonfly stick out like an airplane. So that's a really quick way to be able to tell uh, when you're looking at one of these insects flying around the pond. If, it is, uh, if it's got wings folded across its back, it's a damselfly. But if the wings stick out like these do, like an airplane, then you know you're looking at a dragonfly. Now, a couple of times I've mentioned these characters. Surprisingly enough, we did not have any mosquito larvae when we did our dipping, but this um, is, I tell you, at the front and center of most uh, food chains and food webs within a pond. Mosquito larvae, I know, and none of us are fond of mosquitoes, uh, but they feed a huge number of organisms, whether it's other insects uh, or fish, uh, there's sometimes even some smaller birds that will dive into the water in pursuit of mosquito larvae. So very, very popular prey item. And I just threw this in here so you could get a sense of what they look like. They're called uh, wrigglers, sometimes because they are so active in the water. Uh, this tail structure here at the back, these uh, Circe, um, I'm sorry, Cidae, uh will um, force the insect to move around and back here is a breathing tube. Mosquito larvae can live in um, areas where oxygen is almost depleted because they don't take oxygen from the water, they take it from the air above through a breathing tube right here at the end of the creature. Now um, this is another container. I separated this insect, uh, actually arachnid, out from the other creatures that we found this is um, a little water mite. Uh, and by little, uh, it's, it's actually for a mite, it's quite large. This too is approached the size of a, a pencil eraser. Um, is uh, in their immature stages, uh, aquatic mites uh, tend to live parasitically on other insects. And then as adults, they become predators. Watch this little one move through the water you can just imagine it scuttling through uh, the, the silt and the sediment at the bottom of the pond in search of prey items like, you guessed it, mosquito larva. Um, and this um, here shows um, our back swimmer. This was from our collecting pan. Uh, there's another very similar creature called a water boatman. Uh, the only, uh, well, there's a few differences, but the big difference is that the water boatman swims what I would consider right side up, and the back swimmer swims upside down. If we look at this photo on the right, you'll see um, here's the water surface, and then here's the back swimmer. Here's its oar-like legs that it uses to uh, swim around with. Right here, this is very important. This beak is a piercing and sucking mouth part. This is its key to survival. As it swims around, it can grab insects uh, with these four legs, and then it uh, literally sucks the life out of them. Uh, a lot of different insects are on the menu, but of course, one of them is the mosquito larva. This bottom shot here, this shows what, the, what we would consider to be the top of the insect, even though uh, it's um, at the bottom as it swims. Look at this neat uh, camouflage. These back swimmers are um, very light colored on the back. And when you think about it, that makes a lot of sense. When they're swimming on their backs in the water, anything that's below them is going to be looking up. There's going to be sunshine or light colors from the sky. Uh, so uh, this insect is actually better served by having a white back than a dark back. It helps uh, with its camouflage and its blending in of its surroundings. Now, you noticed in our pan, we had a couple of snails, and I, I want to toss this one out. I don't know uh, if you know that we actually have left-handed snails and right-handed snails. 
Um, the difference um, can be told by placing the snail in your hand with the pointed end facing away from you. Then when you look down to the opening of the snail, the, uh, if the opening's on the right, it's a right-handed snail. If the opening is on the left, it's a left-handed snail. You'll notice on our uh, illustration here, this, these are also called gilled snails and lunged snails. Now that's probably uh, not a, a hugely important factor to you as a human being, but I tell you to these snails, it is uh, literally a matter of life and death. Gilled snails, right-handed snails, they breathe oxygen in through gills. So they must be able, they must be able to find water that has enough oxygen in it that they can survive. Um, a lunged snail, however, um, they will actually go to the surface and take oxygen from the air. So they can live in very oxygen poor water. Uh, sometimes no oxygen exists and they can still manage to survive. Um, and it's kind of a fun trick too to, to find a snail. Uh, again, make it point away from you, stick that end out uh, so it's pointing away maybe towards a friend um, and uh, look and see what side the opening is on. Now a left-handed friend of mine uh, helped me remember which is which in terms of gills or lungs. Um, typically where lunged snails live if there's no oxygen it's, it's usually a sort of a degraded environment sometimes there's a hefty amount of pollution there and uh, again these are the left-handed snails my left-handed friend told me that they are used to putting up with a lot of uh, shall we say stuff from right-handed people so uh, left-handed people um, left-handed snails are, are used to living um, with uh, a lot of stuff to deal with. Right-handed snails, they can uh, survive in a uh, little bit cleaner conditions. Now I threw this other picture in just because these pop up from time to time. The Chinese mystery snail is what we have over here on the right and you'll notice it is huge. Uh, the gilled snails and the lunged snails uh, that we typically see in our ponds are, oh, you know, maybe the size of a fingernail, uh, maybe a little bit bigger. Chinese mystery snails though, are quite large. Um, you know, we're talking a, a big hefty meatball of a snail. Um, these, uh, as you can tell by the name, are introduced. Uh, they were sold, uh, I believe, both as food and in the pet trade. And um, people get tired of keeping them in their aquariums or um, they're not going to eat them. They let them go. And they made their way into a lot of uh, waterways. I always say, if you find a Chinese mystery snail, they make great pets. You can set them up in an aquarium uh, with fairly low oxygen uh, requirements and give them uh, boiled lettuce or frozen lettuce, um, plant material like that, and they will do just fine. And it'll get them out of our, our local waterways. Now, we didn't dip any of these water shredders. They were present in the pond, but I just wasn't quick enough to grab them. Some people call these creatures water spiders, but the, the proper name is actually water strider. Uh, you might recall from biology class that spiders have eight legs. Spiders are arachnids. Let's count here. Our water strider has one, two, three, four, five, six legs. So it is clearly an insect. Uh, some people call these pond skaters because of the way they're able to use the surface tension on the water to skate along. If we look up close here, you can see this creature too has a beak right up here at the head by the mouth. The mouth is a piercing and sucking mouth part, just like we saw on our back swimmers. So these two are predators. They feed on other insects in the water, up to and including mosquitoes. Um, here on the left, you probably have seen these beetles in action. They spin quite rapidly. These are whirligig beetles. Um, these two are, are quite common inhabitants of local ponds. Uh, I love to watch them spin, although I get a little bit dizzy when I watch them uh, spin around. We have a few different kinds in this area. Uh, by and large though, the ones we see are, are fairly small, maybe a half inch or so in uh, width, and they are um, easily identified by that very characteristic movement that they use to um, 
spin around and hunt because these two are predators and they eat other insects, including mosquitoes. On the right here, we have uh, the larva of the whirligig beetle and kind of gives you a, a perspective of uh, just how fierce of predators these creatures can be. Look at those jaws sticking out here. These mandibles are quite uh, sharp and they're quite large uh, considering the size of this uh, insect, which is just a little bit over an inch at this point. Um, again, they are predators and they feed on other insects, including mosquitoes. Seeing a the theme here? <laughs> a predaceous diving beetle doesn't need a lot of introduction. They are predators as well, feeding on other insects in the pond. They're characterized by their ability to dive down to the bottom. Uh, so in, in addition to uh, cruising around uh, using these legs as oars, they are able to push themselves down, down, down and uh, plumb the depths of the pond for their food, which includes insects. Here too, we've got a nice shot of the predaceous diving beetle larva. And again, these large uh, mouth parts that are ready to uh, grab, pierce, and consume lots of different insect prey, <laughs> including mosquitoes. <laughs> the giant water bug. Now there's a couple different types of giant water bug. The one we tend to see in this area is about an inch, uh, inch and a half long. Um, they too are predators, uh, but they have a, quite an endearing quality. Um, they, they swim through the water. Uh, they typically look like this uh, individual here on the left, but every once in a while you get lucky and you find a parent water bug. That's right, these are eggs uh, developing into uh, water bug miniature versions of their parents. and. Um, you might think this is mom, but um, she can't lay eggs on top of herself. She actually lays her eggs on top of dad. So this is a male giant water bug uh, doing his uh, proper parental duties, uh, defending his brood and uh, making sure they stay safe until uh, they hatch and then um, start exploring the world on their own. Now, uh, when we were dipping in the pond, um, we did not find any of this creature here, but I know you're familiar with it. This is a caddisfly, and I tell you, we have dozens and dozens of different types of caddisflies. Uh, if any of you ever um, have traveled into downtown Geneva or St. Charles or Batavia, really any of our river towns, you're probably familiar uh, in the summertime with the river bugs. They're the small uh, they look like little brown moths. Well, those are actually the adult form of the caddisfly. And um, it's, it's, this insect is, is really interesting in that they are not, um, well, they, they are actually the, the aquatic version of a moth. They're not moths themselves, but they are the aquatic um, kind of equivalent of it. You can see the larvae looks very much like a caterpillar except it lives in water and it breathes through gills. Um, this soft body, you can imagine, is quite attractive to a number of different types of predators. So caddisflies have uh, developed a way of defending themselves. Now, uh, in the river, there are some that, that um, just kind of swim around freely and, and they do get consumed at a pretty rapid rate by fish and, and other predators. But uh, there's a lot of caddisflies who will actually... Um, build their case um, by gluing materials together. Now in ponds, they tend to use plant materials. So here we've got these brown bits here. Uh, they look like uh, strips of maybe cattail leaves. We've got some duckweed here glued around the front. Um, this, if um, I'd been a little bit better photographer, you would be able to see there was a little head that would stick out here. When I found this um, in a pond, I really thought it was just a clump of uh, plant material. I didn't realize until I watched it, um, watched it moving through the water and it had a definite, it wasn't just being pushed along by, um, by the breeze, it had a very definite uh, way that it was combing the surface uh, looking for um, little bits of, of plant matter uh, to feed upon. Now, 
Um, this little illustration down here, this shows um, where the, the life of a uh, river dwelling caddis fly, they are a little bit more danger of being carried away in a, in a pond, you know, there's no current. So, so they can afford to have a case that's, uh, you know, that floats and um, they can carry themselves around the pond um, without worry of being washed away in a river. They've got uh, the caddis fly species that live in rivers, they tend to have gripping um, strong legs that they can hold on to the rocks that they, uh, they live upon. And then they, they also uh, will glue their, um, their houses together. Uh, they'll make them, you know, like the three little pigs. Uh, the uh, pond dwelling caddis flies use uh, straw or plant material and the river dwelling caddis flies make their houses out of stone. Sometimes they're able to walk around and carry these blocks with them. Sometimes they actually adhere these stones to the water, again, so they won't wash away. So um, they, uh, these caddisfly larvae will live in the water for a period of about a year, and then they hatch uh, en masse and come out in uh, groups of hundreds of thousands, sometimes in the millions. Again, if you've been in one of our river towns in the summertime, in the midst of an emergence, uh, you're going to see them uh, around the street lights. You're going to see them caught in spider webs. You might even have to sweep them off the windshield of your car. Uh, here uh, we have a picture of a one of the larger species of caddisfly. This is one that would emerge from a pond. You can see it's a, it's over an inch in length. Um, on the left, I'm sorry, on the right hand side here, we have um, a close up view of the more common river species. Uh, again, this one that's on my hand is, uh, oh, an inch or more in length, it's an inch and a half to two inches when you include the antennae. Uh, on the uh, right hand side, these caddis flies are, um, oh gosh, you know, an inch or less in size plentiful food for all kinds of insectivorous, the insect-eating birds. So they, they do play a valuable role. Uh, people, though, wonder all the time, oh, what are we going to do with all these river bugs? But you notice we never um, end up with a, a pile at the end of the summer. They all go away. They uh, get uh, swept up. Um, they get swept away in the, the rivers. They're, they're wonderful food for fish. And then we have many um, insect-eating birds that feast on the, the fat and uh, nutrient-rich bodies of the caddisflies. Now, in our little uh, pond sampler, there were lots of, actually, they looked like um, little bits of dirt moving around, but they were actually living creatures. This is a Daphnia, uh, also known as a water flea. These creatures are filter feeders. They uh, will uh, use their um, the motion that is actually generated by their antennae to swim through the water, and they will slurp. And um, again, the antenna will will uh, force water through the body. Boy, I'm getting dizzy watching this. <laughs> but um, they are filtering out the very fine fine particles that are present in a water environment. Uh, we're talking about minute little specks of algae, uh, little. Uh, zooplankton, tiny, minute creatures. But uh, Daphnia perform a valuable service by being uh, filter feeders like that, and they keep uh, those little bits of algae and those tiny zooplankton from overpopulating. So nice healthy pond will have a good amount of Daphnia or water fleas in them. Now, I hesitated to put this slide in because, let's face it, leeches don't have a great reputation. Um, but you know, I have come to really admire these creatures. You'll see on uh, the left here, I have a picture of a turtle. You might wonder why are we talking about leeches and having a picture of a turtle? Well, if we turn around, uh, go to the back end of the turtle, what do we find but a big fat leech? Now, there are um, several different types of leeches that can live in pond environments, but they're not really interested, at least not the ones we have around here, they are not the least bit interested in human flesh. Um, they're mostly uh, geared towards living on a certain type of organism. A turtle leech will only feed on turtles. 
believe me, I tried. Here's a, here's that same leech. I actually took it back to my office and kept it. I, I was captivated by the delicate uh, uh, designs that it has on its back here. Um, I also uh, was able to watch it. It lived in a, in a gallon pickle jar on my desk for uh, a couple of years, actually. I didn't know leeches lasted that long, but um, I uh, tried to feed it with my own blood and it would have no part of it. I say it because uh, leeches are hermaphrodites. They are male and female combined, but I thought, well, this would be an easy way to give it a meal. Wasn't interested. I uh, went to the butcher. I got some beef liver because some uh, types of leeches will feed on beef liver. These do not. Uh, let's see, what else did I try? I tried uh, a piece of steak. I tried a piece of chicken. Finally, I uh, went into the Hickory Knolls turtle pond and I got uh, one of our painted turtles. I put the leech on and uh, within, I would say five minutes, it had navigated down to the soft um, uh, skin on the leg and it attached itself and it had a nice meal and when it was done it dropped off and lived quite happily for another oh gosh four or five months um, they can go quite a, a long period of time in between taking meals like that and again the, the leeches in our area they do tend to, to be very specific to uh, certain types of animals so as I was waiting around in the pond uh, I didn't have any worries about uh, coming home with a leech. Now, uh, surrounding our ponds, we have a variety of plant life. I, I didn't capture any of it. I didn't bring any of it in because uh, uh, the, um, the seeds of, I, I, I pulled out these three species because they're, they're ones we, we kind of want to keep an eye on in our local ponds. We've got a couple of introduced species and then we've got a native one here. Uh, if you're out and about and you see a pond or an aquatic, um, say a, it could be a retention pond, it could be um, a marsh, but more and more we're seeing this plant here. It's called, one name is Phragmites. They're also known as giant reeds. They were introduced from Europe. They were actually used uh, way back in the day. They, they were used to make thatched roofs. Uh, they were, were uh, introduced into this country. Uh, we do have a native Phragmites, but it is not nearly as uh, invasive as the introduced species. And this one we'll see in retention ponds around the area. Once it's introduced, it's really hard uh, to get rid of, and it can actually invade to the point of using up all the, um, the space that's supposed to be retaining water and um, use that for uh, fueling its own growth. But um, these seed heads here are the reason why we have so many Phragmites in our area. Um, they're a, a species that definitely needs some control. Uh, it's uh, something that a lot of uh, land managers are keeping an eye out for, but if they are, they're quite pretty to look at, but um, I always get kind of sad when I see Phragmites coming into uh, a pond environment. Now, cattails, you're probably familiar with them. Uh, they were one of my favorite plants as a kid growing up until um, I found out how uh, sharp the blades can be on the... Um, on the leaves of these cattails. I got quite cut up one day when I was running after a frog and running through cattails, but ah, that's another story for another time. I wanted to, to call your attention though to the fact that we actually have a couple different species of cattails. Now, um, the narrow leaf cattail is the introduced species. And um, when you look at these seed heads, these brown flowers that the, uh, the cattail grows, these will, each one of these cattail flowers will produce thousands of seeds. Um, it's also true of our, our uh, native species here, the broadleaf cattail. The thing with the narrow leaf though, is that it doesn't have many predators. It uh, doesn't have many things that eat it. There's a, a cattail moth um, and its caterpillars, uh, they can only eat so much uh, cattail. The, the main species that controls cattails in this area is the muskrat. Now the muskrat um, does a, a fine job uh, of eating broadleaf cattails, but it rarely, if ever, will feed on a narrowleaf cattail. Um, 
so uh, when you see a pond that's getting quite overgrown with cattails, chances are it's been invaded by this species here, the narrow leaf cattail. And you might be looking at this going, well, gee whiz, Pam, these cattails look identical. But let's break it down a little bit. Uh, and let's use a uh, common unit of measure, the corn dog. Um, if you see a cattail and it's got a flower head on it that's about the size of a corn dog, that you'd get at the fair. Not the footlongs, but the regular sized corn dogs. That's a broadleaf cattail. Um, it's aptly named because its uh, leaves are quite broad. Um, usually, uh, some of them can be up to an inch in width. So broad leaves and a sort of a squat, uh, fat sort of a flower and seed head that forms. Now, our narrow leaf cattails, uh, the seed head is much longer and uh, sometimes thinner. Um, it would be similar to, say, a, a foot-long hot dog. Um, they are, uh, the, the other troubling part about this plant is that it sometimes hybridizes with the broadleaf cattail. Um, it can produce uh, seed heads that are somewhere in between these two extremes, um, and the leaves are equally unpalatable to creatures like muskrats. So, um, narrow-leaf cattail, nah, broadleaf cattail. Yay, um, let's hope that we see lots of these in our local uh, pond environments. So, you know, as we've looked through the different creatures that live in the pond, you might be thinking, well, you know, why do all these things matter? You know, think of them as building blocks. Those, those little insects, uh, the, the frogs, the tadpoles, uh, all those little tiny things we saw, they are just one link in a very, very large chain that actually grows into a large food web, uh, a whole ecosystem of life revolving around a pond. Um, reptiles like turtles and snakes are often found in, found in pond environments. Probably our most common reptile, um, commonly found reptile, is the um, painted turtle. Now in some of our larger ponds, we might get a big snapping turtle that moves into, but the, the painted turtles, they're so adaptable. They can live in uh, small, medium, or large ponds. Uh, when we look at other reptiles, the, uh, the other very, very common species that tends to move in around a pond is a garter snake. Garter snakes, uh, this uh, particular type here is uh, the Chicago region variation of the Eastern or common garter snake. We call it a, a Chicago garter because of these little bands, these uh, bars here that traverse the yellow stripe on the side. Uh, garters love to eat tadpoles. Garters love to eat fish. Garters love to eat frogs. So uh, to have garter snakes uh, near a pond is um, it's going to indicate that there is a lot of food for this uh, very beautiful representative of our local snake species. Um, fish, you know, depending on the type of pond, we can have lots of different kinds or we could have a few different kinds or if the pond is very small, we could have no different kinds. Um, carp often are, uh, there's a, a species of carp called a grass carp that is sometimes introduced to help control the vegetation within a pond. Um, sometimes sportsmen will introduce things like bluegills and largemouth bass. Uh, and then we will sometimes also get varieties uh, of smaller fish like uh, minnows that will live in a pond environment. Again, um, big feeders upon all those insects that we looked at at the beginning of the program, uh, including mosquito larvae. <laughs> uh, now when we've got fish, we're going to have things that eat fish. Um, you're probably familiar down here with the great blue heron and the great egret. These two birds are very common wading birds that we'll see uh, fishing in ponds. They are sight hunters and then they use their long bills to grab and uh, catch prey, which they then swallow whole, sending it down that long neck. Um, they will wade uh, in the shallows, uh, stand very, very still, and then uh, quickly strike and grab their prey. The smaller green heron has a similar method of hunting However, it doesn't have the long wading legs that the, uh, the larger species do. So it uh, needs to be a little bit more uh, stealthy. You'll see them sometimes hiding under some flopped over cattails 
or in this case, taking advantage of a branch. Now, this um, green heron has caught a small fish, looks like maybe a mud minnow. Um, oftentimes, these uh, green herons will uh, find a surface like this, like the, the uh, hard edge of a stick, and then will smack, uh, kind of subdue the fish until it stops struggling, and then they'll swallow it down. And of course, now I wouldn't be able to, to uh, finish up a, a talk about a pond without bringing up everyone's favorite, the red-winged blackbird. Um, this bird is um, enjoying a, a bit of a, a uptick in numbers in the Chicago area, I think because of the number of ponds we've put in. Uh, most ponds uh, in this area are man-made. They're usually built as some sort of uh, stormwater management, whether they're uh, taking drainage from um, a parking lot or maybe the streets uh, of a subdivision. But we've got lots and lots of ponds in this area, and so we have lots and lots of red-winged blackbirds. Now, this guy, um, I have to be honest, he kind of tormented my coworkers and I. Uh, he would sit uh, above a small pond that we have near Hickory Knolls, and you can see he's uh, letting us have it. These birds are notorious for dive bombing uh, people as they walk by. It, it, you'd think it would occur all the time because of the, the reputation they have, but it actually is, is very tied into their breeding cycle, and it only occurs over a period of a few weeks in the summertime. Uh, Red-winged blackbirds are what we would call a polygynous species. It means that they have several, one male, and this is the male, will have several females. Now the female is, is uh, quite hard to spot. Um, she looks basically like a giant sparrow. She's got brown uh, coloration. She's meant to camouflage in the, uh, the tall grasses, uh, which is where they build their nests. Um, because he has several um, families that he's trying to protect, these guys do tend to go into overdrive um, in the, uh, the month of June. Usually by 4th of July or a little bit after, they're done and uh, they go back to the, living their, their quiet lives uh, once again. Now, I do have a little tip for you if you go out to a pond, if you've been inspired by what we've uh, watched uh, and looked at today, and uh, you find there's a red-winged blackbird nearby, uh, first of all, li listen. Uh, he'll give a sharp uh, little call note uh, that will let you know that he's in the area. Uh, but if you can keep your eyes on the bird, um, he's going to leave you alone. Uh, Red-winged blackbird, as much as he wants to defend his uh, territory and his offspring, his mates, he is not going to want to fly towards eyes. Think of it this way. Um, a lot of uh, predators uh, that menace these birds, um, they, their eyes are situated on the front of their head. So say there's a, uh, a feral cat that is threatening the nest of a red-winged blackbird. If he were to fly towards the front of the cat, towards the eyes of the cat, that cat could reach up, give it a smack with its claws, and that might be the end of Mr. Red-winged blackbird. However, if he flies towards the back and he just gives the cat a bonk on the head, he's going to survive and chances are the cat's going to move on. That's what they're doing when they, when they fly towards humans as well. They don't really mean us any harm. They're just trying to shoo us away so that their, uh, their family has a, a chance of survival. They don't know, you know if, if we mean harm or not and they tend to err on the side of caution and just you know, try to get us to move along as quickly as possible. Well, folks, that uh, pretty much wraps up our look at life in a pond. I would certainly encourage you to uh, get in touch with me if you have any questions. Um, again, my name is Pam Otto, and I'm here from the St. Charles Park District and the Hickory Knolls Discovery Center. Um, contact your activity coordinator if you have any questions. They will pass them along to me, and we will get you some answers. Hope you're able to get out soon and enjoy taking a look at some life in a pond. Take care now.